Secretary Hank Paulson with us today. Uh, he said I only needed to do a brief introduction, so I'll keep it brief. He ran Goldman Sachs for eight years. He was Secretary of the Treasury for probably what seemed like 20 years at times, uh, and he now runs the Paulson Institute. He has taken time out of an incredibly busy schedule, uh, and we are absolutely thrilled to have him and his wife, Wendy, and guests with us today. Secretary Paulson, uh, writing your first book on the, Asia, on the financial crisis was stressful, complete with, I guess, sleepless nights and such as you relive those days. Uh, why did you decide to tackle this book now? Well, John, thanks. Before answering your question, let me say I'm delighted to be here. I'm, you know, really appreciate all you're doing to pr protect our security. I have a history with this place because my, my, my wife's father taught here years ago, so it's, it's, it's fun for us to be back. Yeah, I, when I, uh, you know, writing the first book was not a pleasant experience for me, so when I told Wendy I might write a second book on China, she said she thought she might date again, and she was, and, and she, and she, and she, and she was, she wasn't kidding, and, and, and it took several years, but, you know, I, I dedicated this to my grandchildren because I want them to grow up in a, you know, a peaceful, uh, in, in, environmentally healthy, uh, you know, prosperous world. And I, I believe that it's going to be a lot more possible to do that if we're working in complementary ways with China and a lot more difficult if we're working cross purposes. And as I've talked with about this book, and I've, I've done a fair amount of it, I find two things. First of all, there's a lot of interest in China right now. And secondly, there's not a great understanding uh, of, of China. And it, it's becoming a much more complicated, uh, much more complicated relationship. I think the US-China relationship is by far the most important bilateral relationship in the world. You, it's, when you think back on history, it's hard to f come up with a situation where you have a predominant power and a rising power and they don't come to blows. I had someone the other day say, what about the UK and the US? Well, he forgot his history. They burned down our White House, you know, and, and we've, and so it's, and yet that, that's unthinkable to me that I don't think it's inevitable we come to blows. It's, it, it's, it, and a Cold War I think would be, would be disastrous. But we're dealing with a very different China that's emerging than the one that we've worked with over the last, you know, eight administrations, you know, r roughly 40 years. And, and that uh, because really despite all we've done to integrate them into the global, you know, economic system, into the rules-based system, I think many in China believe now that the U.S. wants to contain them and believe that we will never uh, except a country that has a political system is so, is so radically different than ours, where they, you know, and, and where their leader said, I don't aspire to have a multi party Western democracy, and I don't, we don't aspire to have Western values. And uh, the US, many in the US, this consensus that, that working with China, looking to, to help China uh, grow is, is going to be good for us, is, is breaking down. And so this, this, this new China is now emerged. They're a formidable competitor economically. They have, um, they have uh, a much more muscular foreign policy. Uh, there's a, there's just, there are many, many changes. So we're dealing with a new China, and I think we need to take a, you know, we need to recalibrate. And it's, we have to, recognize that we're going to be competing in certain areas and, and that we're going to have differences and that, that there's nothing wrong with competition if it's healthy competition, if it, we, it doesn't degenerate. And we need to deal with them on, where we have differences in a, in, in a tough-minded, pragmatic way and we can't let that preclude, and this is a key point, working together where we have all these common interests because there's such a thing as mutual interest dependency. If we, if we care about, you know, global economic growth, or if, if you, like I, am worried about climate change and the economic risk of climate change, or what's gonna to happen to our global ecosystem, 
or denuclearization or terrorism, you know, most of these big global issues are going to be much easier to solve if we can find common ground with China and much more difficult if we, if, if we can't. So, so the, the key thing is how to, how to navigate that relationship. And in this book, and I'll, I'll be briefer on your other questions, but, but, but this book, this book is really tells a story of working with three different, uh, th three different um, leadership groups in China to get things done, and hopefully offer some insights on how we sh should work together. Great. So the way you dealt with this uh, complex relationship and found common ground uh, when you were Secretary of the Treasury was in part through the strategic economic dialogue, uh, and this was a pretty ambitious and complex approach, which focused a lot on process. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that, about your role in it, and maybe whether what the role is for such uh, an institution today. Yeah, yeah. And, and I will, won't be terribly brief here, because I, I think this is, this, is, this is fundamental. So the first part of, of the book details my experience at working with Chinese leaders. Uh, who, a number of them are now very, very senior in China today, but working to get things done in China, where we have these landmark financial transactions bringing Western know-how and capital to, you know, and opening up China to, to, to competition and so on. And what I learned in doing that was how their decision-making process worked. And I watched the U.S. government work with them, and I just really thought we had a, a, a decision-making process that, that, that wasn't appropriate for, for dealing with China. And I'll talk about that in a minute. So when, so when George Bush asked me to be his Treasury Secretary, and, it, and I, I'm glad I accepted it. It took me a while. I turned him down the first couple times. And when I was, we were talking about the, the, the conditions, one of the things I wanted to really work on you know, U.S.-China relations, and had an idea for a mechanism which really accommodates certain things. First of all, in China, they have a very diffuse system of decision making. It, it takes, you know, it takes a lot of people to say yes to something, and one or two saying no can kill it. And Often, those that have direct responsibility are, 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 you know, on the organization chart are responsible, but there's a broader group of people that looking at the organization chart, you'd never think they had responsibility, but they do. So, and I really saw, it, it takes direction from above, but to help form consensus below. So we set up this strategic economic dialogue, and before we put it in place, there, I don't, I think there is, almost maybe a hundred dialogues going on or in the, in the administration, in the economic area writ large. And we weren't prioritizing, the Chinese couldn't figure out what we thought was important or not. So the way we set this up in the US, I headed it up as Treasury Secretary, but it wasn't in my role as Treasury Secretary. It was sort of a super cabinet position to coordinate the others. We defined economic issues very broadly. So they included energy, the environment, a whole range of, uh, of, uh, of other things. And, um, and so this meant we had a big group of US cabinet members involved and, and officials and a big group of Chinese. So if, if I wanted to talk to them about currency, I, Ben Bernanke, the Fed was there. And when he talked on currency, it just wasn't the head of the central bank taking notes. There are all kinds of other senior people taking notes. And so, and then the other thing about Chinese, they don't work well together. They're not team players. And the current president, Xi Jinping, with the reason he, he wants the country to, to play soccer and do a better job is they're, they're a country of single family ch children, you know, so they, they, they don't, and so, the, the SED, we are able to, our staff was able to help work with, bring, bring different Chinese agencies together to form a consensus. So the idea was we picked some very important long-term issues to talk about and, and build relationships. We, we met twice a year, and, but we were busy 
working all in between times. So you built good relationships and you worked on longer term issues. We put together a 10 year framework on energy and the environment, which was the basis for the climate change agreement that just was done. It helped set the stage for that. So some were longer term, but then you always would negotiate some, some shorter term deliverables, which were real accomplishments. Because you can have all this mutual interest, but if you don't turn them into tangible results that both countries' populations t t can see to demonstrate there's a value in the relationship, I, I don't think it's the, the common interests make a difference. So we put that in place. Now, so your question is, what's the role in other, it, it, you know, why shouldn't we do it with a lot of other countries? And I, I would say right now, the Obama administration has expanded it so it's the strategic and the economic dialogue. And so it's, it's, it's much broader. It, it's more confusing because the Chinese always want to know who's in charge, you know, and who's coordinating. And some parts, it doesn't work quite as well as you'd like because they view energy and the environment as an economic issue, and we've got that on the State Department side. But it's still, it, this is something that takes a lot of time, and you can't afford to spend the amount of time with every country. And I just thought, because this was so important, and we tend to go from crisis to crisis, and if we spent more time getting US-China right, some of the crises might go better. But I, I think this could, could work well with, with different designs for other countries. I think it could, okay. Um, let's see. During the financial crisis, the Western financial crisis, uh, a friend of yours, Wang Qishan, turned to you and you said, right, yeah. I'm not so sure we should be taking advice from you anymore or something to that effect. Yeah. Uh, so clearly the U.S. may have lost some influence. Was this a, a permanent loss of influence and what's your assessment yeah. today as to whether they're yeah, looking I'm, to I'm us? I'm going to go a little bit because this, you're hitting some, 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 some very interesting questions. So this guy is Wang Zixiong and he's a major character in the book. So I worked with him on the very first uh, big IPO they did, China Mobile. I worked with them on the first bankruptcy in China, which is a revolutionary concept for the Communist Party. Letting a company fail is revolutionary, you know? And he did that. And so he was my counterpart during the financial crisis, which was a huge advantage of the SED because d during the financial crisis, the Chinese were very good partners. And it was shocking for them to see these household, I'd been fighting to open up the, the, the Chinese market to competition from Western financial institutions. Not because I was trying to do a favor for, the, for our banks, but because it's hard to have capital markets work and, and have the kind of liberalization you wanted without having, having capital markets. And so the reformers wanted to do it, but there's huge resistance you know, from all the protectionists in China. So there was a big resistance going on. Then we had the financial crisis. And at first there was just shock on their part, these household names, Citigroup, Morgan Stanley, you know, w w what's going on? Then there was absolute fear because they, you know, they had all these investments and owned our securities. So I was calling them on the phone at night, you know, while Congress was pounding me and telling me how can you, you know, you, we're not going to give you the authorities you need for Fannie or Freddie, and the Chinese had 700 billion of it. And, and I tell the story, the Russians had come to them with a, with a sort of a plot, why don't we unload this and see what these Westerners do. And, and, and so I was saying, well, guess what? Our political system is messy, and the, we're just saying that, but we'll get all the authorities we need. Then I was sort of crossing my fingers. And, but we, so, we, so then we, and, and they stuck with us, and they're good partners. So when he said this to me, what he said to me, when he showed up, at, it was actually at the, at, at the Naval Academy where we had an SED meeting in June of 2008. And he, and, and he said to me, and I was still fighting to open up the markets, and he said to me, Hank, you used to be my teacher, but I'm not sure my teacher looks so smart today. And, and but what the interesting thing was he, of course, he still, he, he now was unable to, to press and get the kinds of reforms they needed. Uh, but at the G20, which we, we put together and, and China really worked with us in putting that together, 
they were in the forefront of fighting for capitalism and for, for, for reforms and so on. But it, it really set China back a lot also because their banking system, which had been defunct 10 years earlier, was used to fund all kinds of stimulus uh, to help power them through the crisis, which has created all kinds of problems. But the lesson I learned there big time, which is a major lesson we should all take away and never forget, people believe in the American dream as long as we're successful with our economy. And it, it, when we have troubles or we're not doing well or we can't fix our problems, no one wants to, to, to follow us. It's not the example. Now, in terms of where we stand today, the Chinese leaders and, and that same man, and I tell the story in the book early on, uh, while many in their com country were being triumphalists, you know, they looked and said the U.S. economy is much stronger than people think it is, and we've got our, our share of problems. And the U.S. economy has been doing relatively well when you look at Europe and a lot of other places in the world. And so I think the lesson to take away from that is when people say, if, if, we, if we don't participate in the TPP or if we don't do other things to show economic leadership, I, I, or if we don't continue to strengthen and do the things we need to make our economy competitive, I think we're going to have a real serious problem. Asian Infrastructure Bank yeah. as well? Yeah. Uh, how is, how is China doing today in terms of the liberalization? And have the reforms peaked? And uh, are we on the downtrend in, in China in terms of especially financial liberalization? Well, I'm going to try to do this one briefer because you can make, people have said to me all the time, have the Chinese invented a better form of capitalism? Are they going to eat our lunch? And I say, trust me, they haven't. You know, that there's no system on earth and no country that's you know, going to outlaw economic gravity. And reform stalled in China for 10 years. Uh, the current leader inherited an economy that has really run out of steam. And it needs radical reform. And basically, if you look around the world, you could say maybe not Europe, the US, Japan, Brazil, most major economies, the economic policies that worked in the past aren't working in the future. And it, it's controversial and difficult to, to, to change them. And so it, these are, are political issues. Well, so Xi Jinping has an economy that have been reliant, overly reliant on exports. And of course, that game is, 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 is not going to continue to work to the same extent. And much more disturbing for them, they had a growth model that relied very heavily on municipal debt uh, to build infrastructure. And, and so they built up all debt much faster than the economy was growing. Great corruption associated with, 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 with that uh, buildup in, you know, uh, in debt. Huge excesses. And mayors didn't have the funding sources they needed. So if they needed money, they took someone's property, sold it to a developer. And, and so this, this debt is backed by real estate. So they've got their own little real estate bubble and floating rate uh, uh, bank borrowings. So they've got these very big excesses. They understand the problem. They've got financial capacity to deal with it. But there's, it's going to be very difficult to do the things they need to do. And he's, this man has accum accumulated huge power, but there's still no consensus. So he's laid out a reform agenda, which is the economy, the markets are going to be decisive and when it comes to allocating resources. Now, they've got a long ways to go to get there because their government is, is sort of the, the exact opposite of the, what y y we would think you would, you would do. Government very involved in the economy when, and when it comes to the social safety nets and you know, the, you know, the social security system and medical care and so on, government not involved. So, he, so he's trying to uh, roll back the state-owned enterprises, open it up to competitions. That's where the jobs have to come from. Meanwhile, he needs to create a new tax system, a new municipal finance system, and, there's, and redefine the relationship between the central government and the provinces. So th th their problem 
is are significant, and I think you could make at least as big a mistake exaggerating China's strength as you could in, in underestimating its potential today. So they've got their hands full, but all those that are hoping that they fail should be careful what they're wishing for. Because when you look at what this would what would happen to what would happen to the to the to the global economy and what the impact would be on us and, and a lot of others, so this is this is uh, this is important, and uh, th there's some very competent people focusing on it in China, but it's a big job. It's a shift a little bit to security. It seems like, uh, although it's related to this question, it seems like the mood has changed a bit um, in the last few years. Security has come to the fore. Uh, on this notion of do we need it, do we want a strong China? And I think at the end of the book, you mentioned somebody asked you, hey, why, why are you helping China? Why, why do you want China to be so strong? Uh, what's your sense in Washington and elsewhere as to whether there is a serious mood shift about, uh, hey, we need to think about them maybe not, not helping so much uh, and maybe worry a little bit more about security and focus on that as opposed to this common ground of economic growth? Well, are things changing? The, the security relationship is much, much more tense and becoming much more complicated. Um, that um, to begin with, you know, the, I, 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 I read, you know, something, I had a tour of the Naval War College and I, I forgot one of your leaders uh, at the Naval War College was quoted, and I think this is where, where the foreign officers program, talking about how, how it was important to get to know each other and have friendly relations. I forgot, uh, uh, interpersonal. And th the fact is, all of the channels and the linkages we ha have right now w with China that are stronger on the economic side. And I think, by and large, their military does not like our military right there surveilling off their shore. Ours, you know, the war games, they're on the other side. When you look at what's going on right now with the, with the islands in, in, in the, you know, in, in the South China Sea or what's going on with, with, with Japan in the East China Sea, uh, there's a whole lot of, 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 of tension. Um, and, and it's serious, and it's something I take very, very seriously. I had someone ask me about that and ask, what is it, you know, what, what is she trying to accomplish, Xi Jinping, who is, who is, I think most of you probably know, but he's the, the current leader. I've never seen any leader, you'd have to go back to Mao to see someone that's accumulates so much power so quickly, and he, basically controls all of the, you know, the military, the foreign policy, the, the, the economic arena right now. What, what, what is he, what's he up to? Because traditionally, you know, what, you know, what Deng Xiaoping, who was the, the leader who, who started the economic reforms, what he had always said was concentrate on domestic affairs and lie low in terms of foreign policy. So now you've got, so what are they, and you hear about, you know, theories about Finland, Finlandization, you know, you know are, are they trying to break up our alliances, and you know, what's, what's going on? So the first thing I would say to people, and I'd say to this audience, because, I, because you're focused on security, uh, I'll tell you, the, maybe the interesting news to you is when Xi Jinping has got in, in my judgment, one overriding priority, bar none, is the preservation of the Communist Party and strengthening the Communist Party. So that's number one, keeping control. He views that as, as, as the key to stability in China. So you start there. And so then you say, what does that mean? Well, that means that before he gets to any, when he's going out with the foreign policy or the military, the, the, the seven or eight things he worries about, top things, are not security. <laughs> He's worrying about how do I fix this economic problem? Because the, the deal that the, that the Communist Party has had, you know, which is jobs for stability, for security. You know, he's got to create 10 or 11 million jobs 
a year. He's got to reboot a $10 trillion economy. That's a lot easier said than, 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 than to do. He's dealing with serious demographic issues, which were, which were made worse by the one-child policy, beginning when, about the time that sonograms became cheap in 1989 or 90 and all the female fetuses were aborted. You know, there's 30 million Chinese males, marital age, that aren't going to have wives. He's dealing with dirty air and water to the point it's a flashpoint. The Communist Party, unless they do things with this pollution, are, 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 are going to have problems. He's dealing with, with, with property rights issues, what to do with the social safety nets. So he's got his hands full, number one. And then I, I think when, his, when, when he's looking at, you know, the Pacific, and what he's doing, you, you, I think the other thing you need to understand is nationalism in China. And his Chinese dream is about restoring, um, restoring China's greatness. And, and so a lot of the foreign policy build up, part of the foreign policy comes from, from it, it, as their reach has grown around the world, as their ambassador said, so of their interests, and so you got to expect them to be, to, to, to be more involved. But he's thinking about, you know, their their place in in, in in the world and in the Pacific, and he knows there's no great power, including the United States, who, who hasn't doesn't have a strong navy, doesn't have a strong military. He's not waiting for us or anybody else to declare them a great power. He thinks they are a great power, and they're going to they're going to start acting like it. But when people start thinking about all this, you know, what's going to happen to our alliances? Let's start with saying, even if the U.S. didn't exist, just look what's in Asia. You've got three very big uh, economies and countries when, you, when you've got Japan and India and Russia. You've got Korea and, and Australia, two middle-sized. So they're not going to just cede the ground to China. And then we have a lot of arrows in our quiver if we use them. You know, we, we, they understand strength. We need to be strong militarily. We need to invest in, in our military capability. We need to be strong diplomatically, and we really need to be strong economically because no nation is, continues to be a great power if they don't have a, 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 a strong economy and fiscal discipline and so on. So I, so I go crazy when I, when I look at Democrats. You know, the, the, the Chinese are using their economic linkages to, to, to promote their policies, their foreign policy, their economic objectives. That's what we did. We got to expect them to do. They're going to act in their self-interest, we're going to act in ours. So when I find it, you know, and I'm not a partisan person, I worked as well as the Democrats as the Republicans, but when I see Democrats, you know, you know trying to sabotage Obama's ability to to, to deal with the TPP, at the same time Republicans are not approving, you know, funding for the XM Bank or, or the IMF. You know, how are we going to be a global leader if we? So when people say to me, "Are we going to be a great? What's what's China going to do to us?" If we deal with our own situation, we'll be a great power for many years, no matter what happens in China. And if we don't, we won't be. Right. So, yesterday, Andy uh, Krepinevich from CSBA was here and referred specifically to the Finlandization issue. So yeah, that's, that's, that's why I mentioned take, that, because yeah. I, I think that's sort of a, it's, it's, I think it's a bogus thing, yeah. Yeah, okay? Because who knows whether they're, whether they're looking at Finlandization, but I don't think that, I, I, I think regardless of the United States, and we're not going to, we've, we've been a, a, a big power in the Pacific for a long time, and China and the whole rest of the world has benefited by the security we've provided and the economic integration. I think one of the risks of China's action, which is not at the time they've got all their economic issues, raising the tensions in, in, in the South China Sea, mm -hmm. is that I don't think war is likely, but what I'm concerned about is also what this is going to do to all the economic linkages and relations and, you know, and, and what the impact there is going to be. You mentioned the South China Sea. Uh, in your book, you write about oil having a special role in the consciousness of China. 
uh, you were involved in some of the IPOs of some of those companies. Do you think South China Sea uh, problems are related to energy, energy resources? Is it about something else in your sense? Yeah, I don't think, I've read all the theorists uh, in China with, with oil and minerals and the South China Sea. I think that's about sovereignty and it, it, it's about China's role. And it, it's a fascinating thing. I, I, I run a Think and Do Tank, which is a not-for-profit. And I have 15 people in Beijing. And a number of them are obviously Chinese. They love the US. They're educated here. They agree with me on most things. When I bring up and, and question some of these actions, they all immediately side with Xi Jinping. I mean, they're all, well, gee, you, you know, you fought on our side, look what the Japanese did to us and, you know, did World War II, you know, they're very, very nationalistic. So, now oil. So, here's what you need to understand about oil. I spend a lot of time thinking about these environmental issues. And so, China, we talked about the U.S. being dependent on oil. China's dependent on coal. So, if you look at China's energy mix, uh, 70 percent is coal, 20 percent is, is oil, 10 percent everything else. And they became a big importer of oil around 1993, and they get about 60 percent of their oil uh, is, is imported oil. And they're very concerned because they get their oil from dodgy places, you know, instability in the Middle East and, you know, in Africa. And so you've, you know, you, you, you hear about the, the, the Moluccan dilemma, you know, the, the oil goes through the Moluccan Straits. That's one of the reasons why they, you know, they, you know the, the Blue Water Navy being able to pr protect that. I think they're increasingly concerned w with the U.S. being less dependent on the Middle East, pulling back all the instability they got there. So what this is doing, causing them to do is looking for these overland routes the pipelines across Myanmar, Central Asia, Russia, natural gas, because you get natural gas, it's, it's, it's not only cleaner, which is very important to them, but you get it from more stable parts of the world, Australia and, and, and so on. So I think the key to oil, what, what, they're, what they're trying to do, and they're working very hard to clean up their air and to meet their climate, uh, uh, climate change objectives. They, they, they want carbon emissions, and they're by far the leading emitter of carbon. They want that to peak, the target is 2030, and by then they would get, you know, go from, get 20% of their, uh, of their energy from non-carbon non -carbon sources. And so that, that is a big driver. And when you look at oil, it really come down, I think, to what's gonna happen with their auto transportation. That's, that, that's, that's totally it. They've got more high, they're the biggest auto market in the world. They've got more miles of highways than we do in the US. And, you know, 10% of the households in China have cars, 60% in the US have cars, 30% in Japan, 50% in Europe. So they've been building these cities that don't work for cars. They've also been building high speed rails. So the two things that are going to drive oil are going to be whether high speed rails went out or autos. And then with autos, what the mix, how many are going to be electric cars is, 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 or hybrids as opposed to the other. But oil is, uh, is very, very important to China. But, I, I, you know, all this thing about the, you know, the, you know, the, 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 the territorial disputes, I don't think are about oil. Conservation is obviously a passion of yours. Uh, where does that come from? And is this the primary focus of uh, the Paulson Institute, or how much are you working on? Well, the, the primary focus of the Paulson Institute is U.S.-China relations, uh, n number one. And we focus on economic issues, cross-investment, and en environmental issues, and where the two come together. Urbanization, sustainable urbanization, uh, air quality and climate change. We do that. We have conservation. We're working with the Chinese government on setting up national parks because Wendy and I have worked there for, for years. But I've been interested in conservation since the time I was a, a little kid. I've been interested in the outdoors. And, uh, and uh, then when we were 
right after we were married, Wendy was the one that frankly got me involved in, 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 in conservation. I, I, I think I was a GS-11 or something at the Pentagon and she was a school teacher and we had you know, eleven or $12,000 of income between us and she came home one day and said, great news, I've become a lifetime member of the Nature Conservancy and it only was $1,000 or something. And, 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 and I about had heart failure. And then, and then she, she got me involved you know, with the Nature Conservancy, which I ended up chairing. She had chaired a number of, uh, of the Illinois chapter and the New York chapter. And, but much more relevant today, if you understand what's happening in, to the global ecosystem, uh, it, it's frightening because we've been living as if we believe that, uh, that natural resources are free goods and that they're inexhaustible. And I think we're close to a tipping point in a number of areas. And so this gets us to China. China, half of all new buildings in the world go up in China. So 40% of carbon emissions come from those buildings. So Paulson Institute is, is focused on, uh, on energy efficient buildings. But if you take a look at half of the steel, half of the cement, is, is, is produced in China. If you look at, you know, I, I, I believe a huge number, I, it doesn't roll off of, of the fish that are consumed, you know, are, are, are China. You look at the, at, at where so much, so much that is going on around the world, whether it's, whether it's Africa or Latin America as China. The, the, the two big, of, I think two big economic events of the next 25 years are going to be the next 300 million people going to the city in China, and that's going to drive global economic and environmental outcomes, and Chinese companies being outstanding global companies because they're increasingly making investments. What are their environmental practices going to be? What, 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 what are their uh, governance, their training? And so the leadership cares much more about these things. And so the Paulson Institute works on conservation, wetlands preservation in China because these coastal wetlands are being destroyed, but also uh, working with them on their practices outside of China, like for instance, sustainable soy and, and, and that kind of thing. So again, the reason I spend time in China is because it's such a big country that touches so much of, of, of the world. And if, if, if we don't work with them, how are we going to even have a hope of solving the climate change issue or dealing with some of these issues with our global ecosystem or providing cybersecurity? And, and or, you know, there's just a whole range of those. Conservation just happens to be one that's uh, particularly Great. close to my heart. Well, thanks. I have uh, many more questions, but I think, uh, if you don't mind, we'll turn Great. it over to students and other guests here. Good. Yes, please. Uh, Jeff Izzo, Department of State. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Secretary, for your uh, uh, insightful remarks. Uh, my question has to do with China's rebalancing, moving away from export-led growth to more towards internal consumption. Well, as you, as you know, requires less investment, which will mean less GDP growth. At the same time, they have to have a certain minimum of GDP growth for social stability, employment generation. In your opinion, is there a sweet spot there that will more or less satisfy both aims? And if not, what are the policy responses for the Chinese government? Well, I, I, well, I can tell you you've studied this a lot, and it is, it's, it's gonna be a messy process because uh, g growth is slowed way down. So they're talking about the new normal and it being 7%, and I, I think that's very optimistic because what's happening right now, and I'm gonna get to this, right now, if they keep investing to drive the economy and infrastructure with government debt and build up excesses, when, when this reckoning comes due, it'll be much greater and it'll spill over into the, the underlying com economy and do great damage. So the question is, where are they going to get the growth? You know, the, the, because consumption's been growing pretty rapidly in China. It's just as a percentage of the total, it hasn't. 
and how do they open up the competition in the service center sector? And to me, it's pretty clear when you look at the numbers that 70% of the employment are, are in the private sector, but yet there's still big portions that are controlled by these state-owned enterprises. The, the national ones, or even the ones at the, you know, at the local government level, and the, they get all kinds of special subsidies and benefits, not just regulatory approval, but energy, land, sponsorship, and they are very inefficient. And so, the key is going to be how do you scale those back, and so that the private sector can get in and compete and create jobs in areas like telecommunications energy, finance. So that's the battle that's going on right now. And the, the reforms that are going the slowest are going on in terms of scaling the state-owned enterprises back. The reason I like the bilateral investment treaty between the US and China is the Chinese reformers, when they're dealing with those that are, that are, that are opposing reform and liberalization and opening up, it helps if they're negotiating something if they got some objective. You know, Zhu Ranji in the days I talk about, in the early days, he wanted to get in the WTO. So he was able to, he knew it was good for China, but he was able to use that. So a bilateral investment treaty could be a hammer or a lever for the reformers to open up to foreign companies to come in and compete and do things, which I think will help them. But in, in terms of the sweet spot, uh, it's going to be hard, it's going to be bumpy to find a, a, a sweet stop spot. I think they'll ultimately, because they're really driven to find reform, and they're also fighting a demographics battle. Will they get, you know, will they get rich before they get old? But, but, but I, I, I tell you, the one thing that I really admire about the Chinese is when you talk to their political leaders there, it's not like talking to political leaders here where, you know, when you say there's a problem, boy, they understand it, they're all over, and they're trying to find solutions. And here you'll say, well, you know, I think this problem exists, and, 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 and people are demagoguing it or talking about, but, you know, or, or, or not owning up to the problem. So they understand it and they're working on it. And I, I think they will ultimately work their way through it, but it, it's, it, it's going to be challenging. Over here, yes, sir. Yes. Um, Mr. Secretary, in terms of having mutual trust with China in the world community, um, there's a little package of things having to do with what we call the law that's troublesome. Yeah. Lee Kuan Yew pointed out that China has to learn that when you sign contracts, they're forever. And then Evan Osnos, you know, quoted Xi Jinping last month in The New Yorker as saying, well, if the Communist Party goes up against the law, if I had to, I'd close all the law schools. So that's domestic law in China. Then obviously you have a lot of complaints about them breaking maritime law. And last but not least, number four on the package is they, they, they hack and they intrude and they steal. And, and that is theft. And some people say that they're, they're at war with us uh, in the cyber community. So those are four, a package of four legal points. How, if they continue to to be so bullying and disregarding of law, are they supposed to accomplish what we all would like? Yeah, I think that is a huge, huge challenge. I say in the book, the reason I went to China so much early on, relationships matter everywhere, but this is a country ruled by men more than law, okay? So, they, so, so you, you start there, number one. Number two, I found um, that in doing business, and I'm going to get back to your more, more important issues, I, I found in, in, in doing business that unlike some other areas of, of the world where people spoke the same language and smiled at you and, 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 and cheated, I found that when we cut deals with them that they stuck to it in, in a handshake. And, and so I, so I and, and found that, and I think a lot of other, uh, a lot of other business people have, have found that out. But so, in, in terms of the law, one of the issues, it is a, it's, 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 a, it's a lawless society. And one of the things that Xi Jinping is, is, is attempting to do, so there's, there's two things that are doing that are just mind boggling if you're, if, 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 if you're not there. It's, it is, first of all, corruption. 
and that this anti-corruption campaign is it has already punished 270,000 people and 70 of the minister rank, and the and but the, so they've got a, a legal system that is really underdeveloped, and we all say, I say, and you say, how can a legal system work? if the 90 million members of the Communist Party don't come under the legal system. That's not the rule of law as we know it. But there's still a lot of room to improve what they've got, and they're working to set up federal courts, district courts. I know the guy I've worked with who, who's the, the head of their Supreme Court, and they're now, just like in property law, they're training judges that used to be party hacks, retired PLA officers in intellectual property, getting trained. They're training environmental lawyers, and so they are, uh, and I think what people are going to find, like, you know, the, and, and I won't say this when, when, you know, when we're dealing with, with international maritime law. I, I've realized very quickly I'm not a lawyer, and it's way over. And so, and the Chinese are coming up the curve very quickly in terms of the, 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 the they're lawyers there, and so I, when I, I get lost in terms of what's an island and what's a shoal, and you know, what is what at, at low tide, and, and and so on. But I, I, I do think that the uh, that one of the one of the challenges, and they're working. You know, this is a president that's working very hard to modernize his government because they don't have the tools they need to to rule that country. You know, he understands that the anti-corruption uh, campaign is not going to wipe out corruption, just scaring people. And he realizes it takes systemic, major systemic changes uh, in, in terms of education, in terms of getting the government out of business, in, in terms of transparency and, 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 and rules, uh, that they can't run the government uh, uh, w without having uh, build institutions. So he's driving reform through the party because it's the only institution that's strong enough to do that. And why is it the only institution that's strong enough to do it is because of the party. We don't have the other institutions. So why would, why would he say that he closed the law schools if law comes up against the Communist Party? Is well, he arguing I, I, against I, himself? I, I would say that, 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 the, that the, with him, you just have to, I, I, I don't defend this, I'm just gonna explain it, okay? In, in his view, and, and there's a paradox going on to all of us, to Westerners, and let me start with something more basic. So he's, he's looking to free up the economy, more flexibility, market decisive. At the same time, he's tightening up the political control, uh, you know, control on the media, uh, the internet, and we look at that and say, those two don't square, I, I, that doesn't make any sense. And he looks at it and says, anything that undermines the stability and, of, of the Communist Party, I'm, I, I'm opposing. And I think longer term, that just plain doesn't work. In an information age, I've run a global company. And you want to have outstanding companies, you want to innovate, you need a free flow of ideas, you need to be connected, you need to know what's happening around the world. But right now, it works for him because the rights that the Chinese people care the most about, you know, going after corruption, property rights, dirty air, dirty water, you know, you know all these things effectively eliminating the one-child policy. He's giving people what they need right now. And in terms of the what, what he's done with the Communist Party, he has got this disciplinary committee, which is run by Wang Xishong. He's greatly restructured that. So it used to be, just like the court system, there was a disciplinary committee in each province. And so the party secretary was like having the party secretary, the, 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 the fox guard the chicken coop. So he's now gone up and he's nationalized that, and he's having the disciplinary apparatus deal with the party and the legal system deal with the rest of China. We don't think it works and, and they know we don't think it works and that we don't think there's, but I, I, would, I would just say this, there are, if you lived in China right now, you would see dramatic, dramatic changes. So this is a guy 
He's looking to change all aspects of society, social, economic, uh, political, and to do it all at once. It's actually mind boggling. We'll take one question back here. Gentleman in the, yes, black yeah. suit, um, and then we'll wrap Mr. it up. Secretary, you said, I think I heard you say that your core advice to the U.S. is to try to operate from a position of strength. Yeah. I just wanted to ask you uh, if you could give us the key takeaway for how we create a perception of strength and, the, and also the one key takeaway for how we create the reality of strength. Well, I want to start with the reality. And because I, again, I say this, you know, we have the best military in the world bar none. And as someone who spent time in government, I was more impressed with career military officers by far than anyone else in government. I don't know anyone else that trains. We don't do any other training other than, uh, 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 other than the military. But the, I, I say, the strength der derives from our economic strength. There's just no doubt about it. And we will not, if we do not get control of our fiscal situation, there's no, there's nowhere, in, it, it, no example in history with, it, with, with any country that continues to be a great power when they let their economic strength erode. Just plain not. And, uh, and, and our policies today, w w we need, you know, our, our entitlements programs, if, if, if they're not fixed, we're just, there, there's, we're not gonna have the money we need to, be, to, to, to do all the things we, we need to do as, as a nation. Um, and I even go further and say, when it comes to the military, we just keep saying we gotta spend, spend, spend more, but we have to spend smarter. And our political system, doesn't let us spend smarter. I, I've heard all the debates. I've worked in the Pentagon. You know, I've, I've seen what goes on in terms of, you know, are, are we really dealing with, with job creation or what's happening in, in, in this congressman's or district or senator state or are we, when, so we have to, I, I think we have to revive our economic competitiveness. We have to get a, a, a tax system that gives us the revenues we need and lets us be competitive. Uh, we need to fix our entitlements. We need an immigration policies, and and, and trade, you know, and, and that is not rocket science. And I'm a big believer that just takes making our political system work, and it, it's compromise. I just got no use for ideologues on other side, on either side. And so, how do we get our political system to work? A lot of this is going to be about which political systems work. And so some people say to me, well, China's ahead of us because they're an authoritarian government. They can just do whatever they want. Well, guess again. I mean, there's huge issues in getting their political system to work. So I would say reality is going to come longer term from having the resources we need. And, uh, and then in terms of military, you would know better than I the difference between projecting power and the, the appearance of power and the, and the reality. But w one thing I do know is that, that China wouldn't want to begin to fight any war with anybody right now. When you look at their military, the, the first thing Xi Jinping cleaned up sorry, was a military. And talk about corruption. You, you remember in the old days when, when, when the British were selling all these commissions, officers, commissions. Well, th this was just rampant in, 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 in China's military. But so I don't, I, I was saying to John, he should read the Economist article that just came out, uh, which is a really a sobering question, really questioning whether some of our long held views about what a Navy should look like and, you know, and, and, and building it around these, these large carriers and so on, what was going to work in the future. So I, I can't get into that. I'm, because I, I don't, I, I am practicing without a license. All I know is, all I know, and it doesn't, I don't hesitate in certain areas, but, but, but this is, we have to invest in, in, in our, 
in our military. But you know what? The military, and I think we, we've seen it in Iraq, we've seen it in Afghanistan and so on. You've, the military's got, they've got a mission, but we've got, there's got to be a strong diplomatic, uh, uh, you know, approach, which was what the SED was. And, and there has to be strong inter economic leadership. And so this is, this, this is part of, of, of the whole package. We're approaching the end of the time, uh, but Secretary Paulson, you've had a, a, quite a range of leadership positions. We're here to educate and develop leaders. Uh, most of these students are now going off to leadership positions. Uh, I just wonder if you would want to leave them with anything in the way of your principles or a few words about what they're going off to do. Well, yeah, I, this group, you know, I, I just loved at, at Goldman Sachs or at Treasury or whatever to hire or work with uh, former military officers because to, to me, in terms of leadership, I, you know, everybody's got their own principles, but I, I'll just give you several that, because I not only worked with ran a company, but I worked when I ran Goldman Sachs with all kinds of CEOs. I've advised heads of state, China, Germany, all around. And I, I begin by saying, I, I've seen leaders with wide ranges. There's no such perfect, there's no perfect leader anywhere. It just doesn't exist. And everyone's got weaknesses and they're the flip side of a strength. Hank is candid, Hank is indiscreet. Hank is decisive, Hank isn't thoughtful enough before it. And so the good leaders have the self-awareness and they surround themselves with people that let them play to their strengths and compensate for their, for their weaknesses. And if they don't do that, they get found out. At some level, you know, they, they, their, their weaknesses are always exposed. So that, that's the first thing I'd say. The second thing I would say and I say this about, I can tell this from someone where they're one year out of school all the way up to, to senior levels. They, the great leaders define themselves, their, their job expansively. They never look at it narrowly. They just say, what's going on? And they're prepared to break class if, if, if necessary. And so that is, and they are accountable. They run to problems rather than running away. It just used to drive me nuts when someone would have a problem in their division and they'd stand up there like they were spectators at the sport saying, how could this idiot have done that, you know, instead of, instead of being accountable for that. And you really learn uh, accountability where you come from. And then the last thing I say to people all the time is it's all about working with others. The, the problems, I haven't, I've seen very few problems that are so complex that it takes some brilliant person to go off and and solve it in their garage somewhere, and everybody's going to say, "Oh, that's that, that's that's a great idea. We're all going to adopt it." And so, that what, to the extent I did well as Treasury Secretary, it was because when I went to Washington, unlike some CEOs that had run big industrial companies, I ran an investment bank where I was. At the same time, as CEO, I was advising clients, so I knew how to work with principals, and I could say to people, no matter how good your ideas are, if you can't persuade the client, it doesn't work. People said, I had all these deals with George Bush about what role I was gonna play, and he turned out to be an tr absolutely terrific boss, and, but I, I realized when I went there, none of them would mean anything if I couldn't build a relationship with him, and if I couldn't, it was gonna be on me, not on him. And the reason I was able to work with Democrats and Republicans is when I called up Harry Reid the first time and he was, didn't even want to talk to me, he, he disliked the Bush administration so much, I said, I'm thinking of you as a client. You know, I'm Secretary of the Treasury, you're leading the Senate. We had him over and Wendy cooked, you know, chicken dinner for him. And we, we, we talked about baseball. But so how you work, and, and I just try to tell young people today who want to do everything, you know, everything with email and, you know, and, 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 and not build relationships. To get anything done that's worthwhile doing, you have to motivate others, you have to care about them, and you have to get them, you have to work together. And uh, 
and so to me, those are the, but this group, I never would have ever expected to make comments because as I said, I think uh, the best leaders in America come out of, uh, come out of the military. And I, I really, really believe that. They're really, really rangy uh, people. And, and, and that's, that was my experience in Washington and, and hiring. Well, our guest travel schedule on five, di five days either side of today looks something like uh, Chicago, China, Chicago, New York, Chicago, West Coast, Chicago. And so I just want to thank you once again for fitting us in and for well, all of your work I, I, on behalf of the I'm honored to be here. Thank you.